Evening everyone and welcome to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton. This is not exactly the show that I hope to bring you tonight. Yet again, we're following the aftermath of another horrific terror attack. And once again it was in London, my home for many years and a city I love. In a moment, we'll bring you an exclusive interview with Britain's former Justice Secretary, who will help us break down the security response to this attack, as well as the long-term origins of the terror threat that we face. But first, we go to Mike Tobin, who's live for us in London. Mike, what's the latest on the ground there? Well, see... Well, Steve, to talk about the very latest, talk about the fact that officials are now breathing a big, deep sigh of relief. And that is because round two of that Ariana Grande concert up in Manchester uh, seems to have been pulled off without any major trouble. You had 50,000 people gathering once again in Manchester. The target was hardened up quite a bit. There was a major police presence out there. Grande herself greeted her fans to deafening cheers and said, this is the medicine the world needs. A litany of other pop stars joined her, and I think we're at the point now uh, where we can say that people made it back home without any major incidents. Also, the latest from the police front. Two raids conducted in boroughs outside of London. Uh, Barking and East Ham are the boroughs that were raided uh, by police. Some 12 people were uh, rounded up as the deputy commissioner of police said what they're looking for now is the extended network. Anyone who may have helped the attackers out here uh, in their planning before this attack 24 hours ago. Police believe, uh, they say with increasing certainty, that as far as anyone who participated directly in the attacks, they're all dead. Steve? So, Mike, the other big event, uh, apart from the concert today, of course, is the general election that's coming up on Thursday in the UK. What are people saying about how this may or may not affect that? Well, it's interesting to watch because uh, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, said that she would call for a one-day moratorium on uh, campaigning, if you will. But then uh, her opponents said that she used her position to be able to advance uh, their position, somewhat uh, criticizing the left, uh, saying that they're going to take a harder view toward Islamic radicalism, using words like evil ideology, saying that they were going to crack down on these uh, cyber safe spaces in which the radicals are, are able to uh, breed and grow, if you will. Uh, the left uh, took a look at that and responded uh, and accused Theresa May and her party of austere measures that ultimately uh, the implication was that they weakened the police uh, and led to this. So they called a moratorium for a day. It didn't last for a day. The gloves come back off tomorrow uh, with the big day on Thursday. Now, the other thing I saw a lot of conversation around on social media was the response of the police last night. Uh, what, what's been the talk around that? It seems there's a lot of support for the police out here and the timing. Uh, this attack happened, and in a matter of minutes, you had armed police on the scene chasing down these attackers. Eight minutes later, it was over. You heard from the uh, deputy commissioner there, the assistant commissioner, saying that some 50 rounds were fired, and you have to keep in mind they were fired on streets crowded with pub goers. Uh, there is a report now that one person was caught with a stray round that uh, stands to reason that that stray round would have come from the police, but you you had big crowded streets, uh, you had attackers that were uh, uh, taken care of, uh, killed, uh, in a matter of minutes and the threat eliminated. Steve? Mike, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And now, uh, we have an exclusive here on The Next Revolution. A short time ago, I spoke to Michael Gove. He was the Justice Secretary in Prime Minister David Cameron's cabinet. I started by asking him what more needs to be done now to keep people safe. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. I just wish it wasn't in such awful circumstances. The UK has had three terror attacks now in just a few months. Um, what do you think people must be feeling? They, there must be a sense that the authorities have lost control. What more do you think they need to do now to protect people? I think there's a, a profound sense of sadness, Steve. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, after the terrorist attacks in 2005, um, when so many people were killed, there were, there were no uh, significant attacks on British soil. There were individual, um, uh, in, uh, individuals who were caught up in violence, but nothing like what we've seen recently. And the Prime Minister's responded by saying that, that more absolutely needs to be done. Enough is enough. She said she's been crystal clear. And I think, helpfully, she's divided our response into at least two areas. She said that, of course, we need to have a, a security response, perhaps a review of laws, perhaps some changes to the way in which, for example, Internet giants operate. 
But also critically, she's put the spotlight on ideology and said that we'll never win this if we concentrate simply on defense and security solutions alone. I want to get into each of those in turn in a second. But, but before we do that, I just want to pick up on something that, was, that really caught our attention here in, in the US after the Manchester attacks. And that was when the, the British security authorities briefed the media to the effect that in the UK today, there are 23,000 jihadis that they know of, but they're only able to track 3,000 of them. Now that sounds like a very scary picture. Is there not more that can be done to increase surveillance and control those 23,000 jihadis that are known to the authorities? Absolutely is. There are Premier League football stadiums that could not hold all those people who are of interest to our intelligence and security services. So more must be done. You are absolutely right. And one of the things that we can look at is uh, using something uh, called the uh, TPIM, a terrorist uh, uh, prevention and interdiction measure, um, uh, we can beef that up. And we used to have something called control orders that meant that individuals who were of interest to us could be restricted in who they saw and uh, what they viewed online, uh, the contacts that they had with others. And these orders would be deliberately designed, sometimes teamed with electronic tagging, to ensure that people who posed a genuine threat and against whom there was clear intelligence were not able to associate with others who were bent on causing you know, the most horrific um, uh, uh, acts. I just want to bring in um, another aspect of this argument that I know a lot of people have been interested in here, which is the whole question of immigration and, in fact, Brexit and the relationship between British law and European law. And this is something that you've been very focused on. Yes. Do you think that, that this is the, the, the ability of the UK authorities to respond to, deal with and prevent terrorism will improve after the UK leaves the EU? Absolutely, and it's not just my view, it's the view of uh, intelligence chiefs in both Britain and America. The way in which European courts operate mean that they sometimes give instructions in effect to our judges and our parliaments that mean that we can't pass the laws or deport the criminals who uh, we think are necessary in order to keep our people safe. More than that, uh, if you have control of your borders and control of your laws, you can ensure not just that you keep people out but that you also deal in a, a fast and effective way with individuals who mean your country harm. And the point's been made before by um, our, our former head of Interpol that um, the current way in which the EU operates provides um, an opportunity for terrorists and extremists to uh, operate with a greater degree of freedom uh, than, than you know, any of us would want to see in the interest of national security. Now, another version of that that Theresa May pointed to today in terms of giving uh, terrorists and potential terrorists uh, the freedom to operate, and, and in her phrase, safe spaces to operate, is online. And she had a very strong message today for Silicon Valley-based tech companies, uh, calling on them to do a lot more uh, to fight terror. Where do you stand on that question? Well, I think that one of the precious things that the Internet has brought is the ability for people to communicate, make connections, uh, marshal information, and strengthen relationships, and that's a, that's a great thing. But as with any new technology, there's also the potential for people who, who wish us ill and who want to, in effect, destroy relationships, end freedom, uh, banish um, us back to the Dark Ages. There's a possibility that they can exploit that in specific ways. And what I'd like to see is uh, leaders of tech giants and governments working together, because I think it would be wrong if we had heavy-handed legislation that would uh, inhibit the free exchange of information between citizens across the globe. But we do need to recognize that there are routes and paths that are exploited by terrorists, and if we can find a way of ensuring as we have, to be fair, in the past uh, with issues like child pornography, means by which some of those responsible can have uh, uh, their activities closed down and then can be hunted down themselves, so much the better. But how did all this start? Next, you can see part two of my exclusive interview with Michael Gove, where he explains the long-term nature of this terror threat. I promise you, you will not hear a better explanation of what's going on anywhere. You won't want to miss it.
Welcome back to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton. ISIS has claimed responsibility for the London terror attack, but tonight I wanted to go deeper into the ideology behind these attacks and how far back this really goes. More now from my exclusive conversation with former UK Justice Secretary Michael Gove. So Michael, I just want to take a couple of steps back now from the immediate focus on on the security response to this and actually um, look at the real origins of this threat, the nature and origins. This is something that you've studied and written about actually long before you had responsibility for these matters in government. Um, you wrote a book about this many years ago, Celsius 7-7. I just want you to explain to our viewers as simply as you can the real historical origin of this thing that we keep talking about, which is the Islamist ideology. They hear that phrase and, and they perhaps don't know exactly what it is and where it comes from. And in fact, some people might misinterpret that as meaning that we're just talking about Islam. What is this exactly. Islamist ideology? When did it start? Where did it come from? Absolutely, Steve. You are... Uh... 100% uh, right that we need to be clear that we're fighting an ideology, not a religion. There are some people who say that uh, this violence has absolutely nothing to do with Islam. That's a mistake. But there are other people who say that this violence is inherent in Islam. That is also a big error. Uh, Islamist ideology is to Islam as communism was to socialism, or as uh, fascism was to nationalism. It takes a, um, a, a noble ideal. Socialism is a noble ideal of sharing, nationalism a noble ideal of patriotism, and Islam is a noble faith that uh, sustains and inspires billions globally to acts of charity. But what Islamism does is that it turns that generosity into resentment. And Islamism says it's not enough simply that faith should be a private thing and that it should be a way of inspiring charity. Islamism says that it's a responsibility of Muslims to create an Islamic state with very, very strict Sharia law and to fight against those who are unbelievers in order to advance that goal. And the creation of an Islamic state, whether it's the caliphate that currently um, uh, straddles Syria and Iraq or something altogether more ambitious, is what drives Islamists. It's what drove Osama bin Laden, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and the guys who are responsible for the atrocities that we see. And it's, it's futile to think that they're driven by distaste for this or that president or this or that foreign policy. What they're driven by is a deep, dark hatred of the West, of liberalism, of Christianity and Judaism. And the way to defeat it is to be clear that the ideologues behind it, people like Saeed Qutb and Hassan al-Banna, who were the Egyptians who helped form and develop the Muslim Brotherhood, and people like um, Maulana Maududi, a Pakistani thinker who set up a Jamaati group, which is in essence the Muslim Brotherhood in, in South Asia, we need to study their writings and counter the organizations that operate in their name. So you mentioned a few of, of, of the people who've been really driving this ideology. Let, let's just really unpack that a bit. When, when, when can we trace it back to? How long has this really, this, this force, this, this very violent and destructive negative force as you describe it, how long has it been around? Is there a point where we can say this is the person that started it? There have been currents within Islam that have been uh, violent and austere and extreme in the past, including the uh, uh, Wahhabi movement, which um, uh, obviously has stood behind um, the, uh, the Saudi monarchy. Um, but uh, Islamism, as we currently uh, witness it, is essentially a 20th century phenomenon. It was a reaction to the, uh, uh, what was seen as uh, Islam's decline. Uh, people thought in uh, uh, post-colonial Egypt and in post-colonial Pakistan, look, Islam once uh, swept all before it. Now we're in retreat and our societies are, are poorer um, and less well governed. Why is it that when we were in receipt of what should have been the, you know, the final and perfect revelation, when we should really be the chosen people, that things are so wrong in the Muslim world? And the conclusion that they came to in the uh, 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s, is that Muslim leaders had um, been insufficiently pious, Islamic, austere, indeed insufficiently extreme. And for that reason, the, uh, they'd been um, on the retreat. And so these individuals said, if we are going to recover um, you know, the, the position that we had in the world um, more than a thousand years ago, what we need to do is to go back 
to seeking to live literally, in many ways, as the prophet and his companions lived in the 8th century. And that's meant a very literalist and fundamentalist interpretation of the faith, allied to a sophisticated use of 20th and 21st century technology in order to try to advance their goals through propaganda and through violence. Michael, thank you so much for that. I thought that was just an incredibly helpful explanation that puts this in its context, that this goes back now nearly a century. This is not something that's just happened because we invaded Iraq, whatever you think about that. This has been going on now for many, many decades. I really appreciate you explaining that to us. If people want to understand it more deeply, and I think everyone should try and make that effort, your book is a great place to start. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Now, here's an interesting angle on all this. In her remarks today, UK Prime Minister Theresa May blamed Silicon Valley for helping terrorism thrive. Is that fair, or is she trying to shift blame for her own failures? After the break, we'll debate with our panel, including Silicon Valley's very own member of Congress. Blood sugar can. I've spoken with Prime Minister May and expressed our unwavering support for our allies in the United Kingdom and pledge that the United States will do everything in our power to assist the United Kingdom and its citizens as they work to protect their country and to bring those that are guilty to justice. America sends our thoughts, our prayers, and our deepest sympathies to the victims of this evil slaughter and we renew our resolve stronger than ever before to protect the United States and its allies from a vile enemy that has waged war on innocent life and it's gone on too long. This bloodshed must end. This bloodshed will end. That was President Trump just moments ago expressing his support for the UK and vowing to find justice in the wake of the London terror attack. Welcome back to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton. Now, one of the striking things about Pro British Prime Minister Theresa May's remarks outside 10 Downing Street today was her extremely aggressive attack on Silicon Valley's role in helping, according to her, terrorists to operate. Take a look. We cannot allow this ideology the safe space it needs to breed. Yet that is precisely what the internet and the big companies that provide internet-based services provide. We need to work with allied democratic governments to reach international agreements that regulate cyberspace to prevent the spread of extremist and terrorism planning. And we need to do everything we can at home to reduce the risks of extremism online. To discuss all this, I'm joined here in the studio by Congressman Ro Khanna, a Democrat who represents California's Silicon Valley. Co-host of Outnumbered, I'm so pleased you're here, Sandra Smith. Happy to all be All the here. way to join us on our first show. So fun and so inspiring to hear your fresh thoughts, oh by the way. Well, it's wonderful to see you. Thank and you. also, Rehan Salam, Executive Editor of National Review and a National Review Institute Policy Fellow. So, Congressman, I go to you first. You represent Silicon Valley. That was a pretty strong attack. Yes. She was pretty much blaming the tech companies for terrorism. Well, on a human level, my heart goes out to the Prime Minister for the incredible loss. But after her elections, I hope she'll come visit Silicon Valley and see what's going on on the ground. I'd love to show her around because we have to have a factual approach. And the facts are that the big internet companies don't have a policy of safe spaces. Quite to the contrary, they have a policy that says they want to create a hostile environment for terrorists. And specifically, they will remove anyone who's promoting terrorism or who's recruiting terrorism. Uh, to the point that a lot of these internet companies have removed usernames, suspended usernames, even when law enforcement isn't asking. And so the question is, how can they continue to do this while keeping an open internet that is actually the biggest challenge to totalitarian authoritarianism? Uh, Iran, China, Russia, that's how they're challenged, and that's how we're going to defeat this ideology. So look, I'm not sitting here, um, perhaps as, as you just were, you know, 100% defending the, the tech company, but there's one thing about this that just actually really drives me crazy, which is it's all very well um, for politicians to blame the tech companies. They always want more powers to snoop and spy and all the rest of it. But at the same time, every single time we have one of these attacks, it turns out, Sandra, that, we, that the authorities knew 
the people that were involved. I mean, this, this particular headline in the London Times, I think we have the headline in the Times of London. London Bridge terror attack extremist was reported to police for trying to radicalize children. And we learned one man reported him to police after learning he had accessed the online rants of a radical American preacher. Another woman, an East London housewife, said that she had told of fears that he was recruiting local school kids. But this plays to the fears, and Theresa May is playing to the fears that we have every time we see these terrorist attacks. We then learn there were red flags. They announced the attack on Twitter or Facebook. Then they claim responsibility on these social networking sites. So then you get Theresa May standing up there and playing to the fears of people who say, why aren't these technology companies doing more? They get away from the root of the problem by asking that question. But you just hit it with uh, Justice Gove, the former uh, Justice Secretary, with your wonderful interview. He said these technology companies have to be willing to work with government. I'm sure you could tell us more on whether or not they are doing that, but we know that they have a huge task at hand. Mark Zuckerberg just hired 3,000 more workers to try to fight this. There's a lot of questions about whether or not they can stop this from happening. But why, I mean, this is the, why are the, never mind the tech companies, why, if the police, this was all with Manchester, I did, right? I did. The Manchester attacker was reported to the police on the anti-terror hotline. Same as this case. Well, why aren't the police doing more? Okay, we saw earlier, great response last night. Lots of support for the police in their response to the attack. But what about before the attacks even happened? Well, Sandra mentioned this American Islam who had YouTube videos that were posted, right? And who was indirectly radicalizing one of these attackers. The thing is that this guy actually is in jail right now, this radical American imam. He has not been regularly creating fresh, new, exciting internet content. This is old content. So one way to think about it is that the virus is spreading over the internet. But the vast majority of people have antibodies. They're resisting the virus. Who are the people who are susceptible to the virus? So on the one hand, you have some of this that is spreading via the internet. But on the other hand, you have real world social networks in which you have people talking to one another and they take abnormal repellent ideas and they make those abnormal ideas seem normal through those social interactions. The reason why ISIS is proving in some ways even deadlier than Al-Qaeda is that Al-Qaeda had a very top-down, very controlling kind of approach. They said, we're going to give you the operational plans, we're going to have clean skins, people with no uh, criminal record, and we're going to have them do our bidding. Whereas ISIS takes a much more open source approach in which they have scads of people from working class neighborhoods in Brussels and Paris coming to join ISIS. They radicalize them. Then they actually come back to their native countries and they spread this hateful ideology. And it, again, it happens through real world on the ground social networks. So of course the internet is a part of it, but it's a much smaller part of it than we'd like to think. Technology is not going to solve this problem. The real problem is happening in real world communities. Well, we're going to be talking a little bit later about, about that question of what goes on in communities and, and the integration or lack of integration. But I just want to come back to the security response, the, the policing. If we have time after time these attackers known to the authorities, that's the phrase that's always used, they were known to the authorities, why, why isn't anything happening? But what did Justice Secretary Gove just tell us? And you saw me taking all my notes over here. He said football stadiums could be filled with the amount of people of interest to London authorities. How do you do that? How do you handle that? How do you handle that big of a threat? Well, I, I know. I just, what, what you, how? Let, That's a good let, let me suggest two ways where actually technology uh, can help on this issue. Uh, one is we've got to tell counter stories. So the refugees that are coming, right? Why isn't anyone saying, why are they leaving ISIS? They're leaving ISIS uh, because that's a god-awful uh, existence. They're coming to America because we've got the best existence in the world. I want to put the refugees on the Internet telling their story. That's what Ronald Reagan would have done. He would have had the refugees say, uh, you're leaving ISIS. You're coming to the greatest country in the, in the world. Tell your story. And let's put that out on social media. The second thing is there's a Dartmouth professor, uh, Hani uh, uh, Farib who has came up with a software to deal with child pornography. That's why we don't have uh, as many issues of child pornography. Well, let's fund uh, his research to make so sure that we come up with artificial intelligence and the type of software he's working on that will identify hate-filled terrorism-promoting videos and will allow tech companies to do this. So what I'd like to see, and I really am serious about hopefully the Prime Minister coming to Silicon Valley, is let's have concrete solutions uh, that will actually advance this, this fight. So you, you mentioned them leaving, 
and uh, the, the sort of hotbed of, of incubation of terror and, and, and going elsewhere, a lot of them to Europe actually, as well as here. But it does feel, Sandra, that actually in this new administration, you've got a different approach in terms of the, the uh, foreign policy, the, the, the attacking of ISIS at its source. What do you, what do you make of that? I yes, think that, that I mean, people should be reassured. You have got a new president in this country who is saying we have got to acknowledge that we are at war. You've got to name the enemy. I mean, that is such a huge contrast to what we saw the last eight years in this country. Um, this is a president that is tackling this fight head on in a completely different way than we're used to. And it's causing a very emotional response in this country. Uh, but whichever side of the aisle you sit on, mm -hmm. there's a huge problem that, this, that is falling right in the lap of this president. I mean, it is an unbelievably historic yeah. moment. I, well, I, sorry, we, we, we're going to have to uh, pause there. We're going to come back and, and talk about a lot of different aspects of this. Um, because stopping the isolationism that leads to radicalization, we've been talking about it, is such an important part of it. And we'll get back to it, but we need to take this break first. Thanks for being with us as we cover the news from the UK. Twelve years ago, London was also hit by Islamist terrorists in a coordinated set of attacks on the buses and the underground. It was the first time the UK had to face the reality of homegrown Islamist terrorism, that there were people born and raised in Britain who were prepared to murder their fellow citizens in the name of their sick ideology. Just at that time, twelve years ago, a young politician named David Cameron was preparing to run for the leadership of the British Conservative Party. I was right by his side as we prepared a response to the 7-7 London attacks. We called for a tougher security and foreign policy response, but we also focused on something else. The fact that over many years of failed policies, Britain had allowed a dangerous social isolationism to take hold, especially among the Muslim community. We wanted to see more cultural integration. Here's what David Cameron said at the time. The most powerful way to bring people together is to do things together. He went on, I'm always struck when asking anyone of my father's generation who did national service by the fact that they tend to reply in a similar way. It was something we all did together, irrespective of who we were, where we lived, where we came from, or what God we worshipped. So 12 years ago, we set out a plan for a modern version of national service. Something that prepares teenagers for their responsibilities as adult citizens. That enables them to meet people from different backgrounds and to learn about the realities of life in different communities. And which teaches them the lifelong lesson that we're all in this together. That we have duties to our fellow citizens. Now, unlike many things in politics, that was a promise that we delivered. We set up something called National Citizen Service. 200,000 British teenagers so far have gone through it. And it's well on the way to reaching the goal that we set out, that every single young person in the UK should spend some time away from home with people from different backgrounds serving the community. Now, thankfully, America is a much better integrated society than Britain. But we need to work hard at it. So I think that a program for modern national service would be a great idea for America today to help make sure that isolationism doesn't grow. Rayhan, what do you think? I find the idea attractive, partly because I see a lot of challenges ahead. A lot of Americans are very sanguine about the fact that we don't see the same kind of terrorist violence you see in parts of Europe, but I think that we're a little bit too sanguine, because we are seeing some similar conditions. When you look at migrants who settle in the United States, a key thing to understand is that those migrants bring with them many things. They bring with them skills and talents. They bring with them complicated histories. And some of those sets of skills and talents and histories allow them, make it very easy for them to flourish in this society. But there are others for whom uh, that's not quite the case. And in those cases, it's very easy for resentment to build up and for alienation to take hold. Uh, if you look at Britain, for example, you have folks who came from rural Pakistan, for mm -hmm. example, and who even now, you know, people who are the grandchildren of those early arrivals, they continue to be socially segregated from other folks. In this country, you know, when you look at our Muslim population, it tends to consist of people who are somewhat more educated and what have you, who mm -hmm. tend to be more likely to be professionals and what have you. So you don't have the same 
kinds of challenges. But you know, going forward, I think you already are seeing some kinds of ghettoization and some ways in which you have people living in some communities, their lives are so different from mm -hmm. those who are better off. And the thing is that these are people who are native born. In yeah. Europe, you're seeing the second generation. For example, we talked about refugees in the previous segment. Uh, actually, the Manchester attacker was the son of Libyan refugees. The, Britain opened up its arms to welcome these people, to take them in, and yet the son did not whatever reason, feel like a full member of British society. And, and that's something that's pretty scary. So I think that you're right that we need to be vigilant. And if citizen service is one way that we can help build those bonds, I'm all for it. But we also need to be very thoughtful about the people we bring into the country. Mm -hmm. Are they people who are going to be in a position to flourish and succeed? Or are they going to be people who are going to need a lot of help uh, that we won't necessarily be able to provide? Well, look, I mean, I, I think that's just a really smart analysis of where we are and congressman i wanted to get your take on it in terms of you know i'm i'm an immigrant to the u.s um and one of the things i think is so attractive is the idea that there's this this idea of america that that we buy into do you think that that is holding that that we do have this shared sense of national identity or do you think that it's actually something that that may be in danger of slipping away and if so what do we do about it well, I'm a uh, bicentennial baby born in Philadelphia in 1976, uh, to the son of immigrants. So I think this common American identity is really important. And here's what I think we ought to do. I mean, I'm open to a national service, but every American ought to read four things. The Declaration of Independence, the United States Constitution, the Gettysburg Address, yes. and the I Have a Dream. Well, by the way, I love that. And one of my favorite things I've done since coming here is going to the National Constitution Center with my children Thank in you. Philadelphia. Sandra, last word to but you on this. But that's what it's about, is, is learning what it feels like to walk in someone else's shoes. And in this country, you're seeing such a sensitivity, a, a fear over what divides us, that we're so quick to say, no, you can practice your religion here, you can have your culture here, but just go do it over there and we'll do our thing over here rather than uniting and learning from those other religions and learning from those other cultures. Mm -hmm. I like the idea, but you know, I'm a business girl and I'm wondering what the cost <laughs> are. Who's going to pay for I knew you were going to say that. Well, thank you, thank you all very much. Thank you. When we come back, we're going to change gears a little bit, actually quite a lot. President Trump pledged to drain the swamp, and I'm pledging to make sure he does. We'll introduce you to a segment you're going to see a lot on this show, Swamp Watch. The next revolution is coming right back. Thanks for staying with us. I want to change things up for the next few minutes. You'll see a lot more of this as the next revolution moves along, but I wanted to give you a taste tonight of what we mean by positive populism, how we're going to be fighting elitism and championing the interests of working people. It was one of the main messages of the Trump campaign. We are going to drain the swamp. But what is the swamp and why is draining it so important? The swamp is the corrupt web of money and power that the elite have created to make sure that their interests come first. Politicians, lobbyists, advisors, consultants, bureaucrats, technocrats, corporate apparatchiks. From now on, we are going to be on their case in a weekly segment called Swamp Watch. We're going to be holding all these swamp dwellers accountable. I love that. We're going to be holding all these swamp dwellers accountable, as well as the president, for his promise to rein them in. This week, we're focusing on the banks, because their tentacles reach throughout our economy and affect everyone's life. In fact, this industry is so consequential that a former editor of The Economist, hardly a left-wing outlet, recently said that banks are, quote, the single biggest cause of rising inequality distortion of public policy and generation of collective economic pain and anger. The banking industry has an especially swampy stench because of the revolving door between banks and the government. Here's a case in point. Keith A. Narika was just appointed head of the office of the controller of the currency. That puts him in charge of regulating the banking industry, an industry he spent his career protecting. Narika worked for years at a prominent law firm where he represented banks many of which are regulated by the office that he now runs. But that's not enough for this swampy industry. They want to make sure the people at the top of government are on their side too. Bill Clinton appointed Robert Rubin, who spent 26 years at Goldman Sachs, as his Treasury Secretary. George Bush had Hank Paulson, Goldman's former CEO, as his Treasury Secretary. Swampiness, it turns out, is bipartisan. 
Perhaps one of the most blatantly corrupt examples was the case of President Obama's second Treasury Secretary, Jack Lew. Lew was chief operating officer of Citigroup, where the bank paid him a $900,000 bonus just weeks before he rejoined the federal government in 2009. This is the same Citigroup that had to be bailed out with $45 billion of your money. The putrid swamp is a lush garden for guys like Jack Lew. And before you think President Trump is so far any different, his pick for Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin, also worked at Goldman Sachs for many years. Just like half the top team in the White House, or so it seems. But maybe our saving grace is Congress. Surely our elected representatives there put our interests first. Hmm, not so much. The House Financial Services Committee regulates the banks. And guess which industry is the biggest donor? to members of that committee. The amount of money slushing around this committee has made it highly desirable for any congressman, so much so that it's known on Capitol Hill as the Cash Committee, because sitting on it guarantees... Our congressman here is nodding. It's true. <laughs> because it guarantees fundraising success. What's more, many committee members, not the one here, have direct and close ties to big banks. Representative Steve Stivers was previously the top lobbyist for Bank One. Jim Hines of Connecticut spent 12 years working at Goldman Sachs. Representative Kevin Yoder got $211,000 from the securities and investment industry and another $145,000 from commercial banks in two years, 2015 to 2016. It was a good deal for the banks, though. In 2014, Yoder introduced legislation to allow banks to carry out the same practices that some argue caused the financial crash. How lovely for the banks that they have all these members of Congress fighting their corner. And wouldn't it be great if we could come up with some kind of system that would allow working Americans to have their interests represented in government? No, you're right. Let's not ask for the moon. In the meantime, spare a thought for the members of Congress who sit on the Financial Services Committee. So many of them want to be on it that they were getting all squished together, the poor loves. So what did they do? Choose the members? who are best placed to pass wise legislation to regulate the banks? Uh, no, they just added extra rows of seats. That is this week's Swamp Watch. As we absorb the news of another terror attack, when we come back, I'll set out my priorities for the action plan we need now. That's next. Stay with us. So the theme of this show is positive populism. And I want to make sure that every week we leave you with a positive agenda for change on the big issue that we're talking about. Now this week we were planning to talk about what I think is the number one issue in America today, jobs and incomes. And I promise you we'll get to that next week. But for now I want to leave you with my priorities for fighting the terror threat that was highlighted with the London attacks but which we all face. Number one. We need to attack the incubators of terror with overwhelming military force wherever they are in the world. But that's not enough. Two, we need to improve our domestic security response. The attacks we're seeing are not from lone wolves, but known wolves. If security services know about them, they should be able to stop them. Three, no more defending the indefensible. As we heard from Michael Gove, countries like Saudi Arabia have deliberately stoked Islamist extremism, and they need to stop. And finally, number four, let's work on a plan for modern national service for all American youth to help bring our country together and stay together. That's all we have time for tonight. You can learn more about The Next Revolution by following us on Facebook, on Twitter and Instagram, at NextRevFNC, and Snapchat, NextRev. FNC. But before we leave you tonight, my thanks to my first panel here on The Next Revolution. I'm so happy you could join us. Yay, Congressman Ro Khanna, co-host of Outnumbered Sandra Smith, Rehan Salam. And thank you to you at home for joining us. I just about got through it. I hope you did too. I'm Steve Hilton. Join us again next week for The Next Revolution.